on Life and Meaning is brought to you by Blumenthal Performing Arts, celebrating its 25th year presenting the best in the performing arts, sharing and employing the arts as a major catalyst to strengthen education, building community cohesiveness, and advancing economic growth. Further support is provided by Charlotte Mecklenburg Library, one of America's leading urban public libraries, delivering exceptional services and programs with a mission to improve lives and build a stronger community and by the Arts and Science Council, Charlotte Mecklenburg's resource hub and lead advocate for the regional cultural community, providing culture for all. Fast forward to now, and I've been off lithium for a long time, and had to find something to replace it. And um, now I look back and I realize how, even though I've been lucky as a person diagnosed with mental illness, and I have a new diagnosis, which is schizoaffective, which is a shorthand, it's a combination of paranoia, which is associated sometimes with schizophrenia, and what they call an affective or mood disorder. And it turns out I never had that classic up and down mania. What I had was depression with the inability to calm down or read or concentrate. So schizoaffective tells a different story. Kaylee Ferguson is a storyteller and cultural educator. She performs original poems and songs and fractured fairy tales in English and Spanish in classrooms, museums, churches, conferences, and festivals. Kaylee shares cultural literacy through the Latin American and African diaspora tradition. She is the owner of Communiculture, a cultural education and teaching artist platform, and the founder of the African American Latinx Bridge Building Awareness Program. She has served as a consultant, curriculum creator, and facilitator with the American Friends Service Committee, a Quaker organization that promotes lasting peace with justice as an expression of faith in action. In this episode, we explore a fractured fairy tale, the wisdom of joy, growing up in a prominent family, and a story of psychiatric illness and health. I'm Mark Paris, and this is On Life and Meaning. Welcome, Kaylee. Thank you. One of the stories you tell is called Blanca Flor La Negra. Tell me about that story. So Blanca Flor La Negra is an adaptation of a traditional Spanish and Latin American fairy tale. And I took it and totally flipped it on its head. So Blanca Flor is the main character in the traditional story She actually is the secondary character who saves the main character who is a young man who makes a deal with sometimes it's the devil, sometimes it's great lord of this or that. So Blanca Flor is, in my version, now the protagonist. And she is, we should say, we could say bullied by her two older sisters and her father because she's a failed magician because her family is evil and she is unable to do the evil magic that her family does. And long story short, this young man who's made a deal with her father comes to their mystical land and he escapes her evil family and she finds her personal magic. Now that I've flipped it around, they call them fractured fairy tales. So now that I've made it fractured, I love it because I control the narrative. And as you know, I like that. So, but also because I got to make her represent round, brown, clumsy girls like I was and like I still am. So it's just a really fun way to to make folks think if they're not brown brown and clumsy or girls 
And if they are, which a lot of my uh, young audiences are, it gives them an image and, and some hope about not having to be valued only because you look like the standard of beauty. And, you know, for, for girls, that's really important to know about our worth beyond that. You've described your retelling of Blanca mm -hmm. Flor as a personal parable that explores race, gender, beauty, and freedom. Yes. I feel we need to find beauty in ourselves as women, as brown, black women, and, and as big women. Those are all things that through our lives can make us question our beauty and because of the world now, therefore our worth. So that's the beauty thing and the gender thing. Race also, actually in Latin America, a lot of times I've noticed I've lived in Costa Rica and traveled to Panama and I've traveled to, to Spain. A lot of times folks don't address race, even in the way that, that we do in the U.S. And also Blanca Flor is brown, but her sisters, their skin is porcelain white. And in Latin America, that's possible, um, especially in Caribbean families. You can have somebody that's very dark. You can have somebody that's pelo rubio, which is, you know, redheaded. In the same family. So race wise, it's a way to address the subtleties of racism that I see in, in Latin American culture that is not seen in the same way as it is in the U.S. Being that she is brown, but her family has light skin. I think part of the reason why folks don't see racism existing in the same way in Latin America, or even when they come here, is because you have folks in your family like, well, I love my cousin so-and-so. I'm not racist, you know, that kind of thing. But race is very, very important and um, impactful also in, in Latin America. It's interesting that your heroine is a brown, round girl, but the name <laughs> Blanca Flor means white flower. Great question. So the, the original fairy tale is named Blanca Flor. And that's why I tagged La Negra, right, on there, because, of course, La Negra means the, the black girl, the black one. And I deliberately kept Blanca Flor as the name because you'll ask that question when you see it, right? And also the reason why she's called Blanca Flor in the story is because her magic only turns things into happy white flowers, so it's, it's actually her family picks on her by calling her Blanca Flor. But the name of it is to race questions. It makes people go, wait a minute. And then we get to talk about race. Mm -hmm. Kayla, you've been telling stories on stage for many years. Why do you tell stories? I think I can't not, <laughs> which I'm sure a lot of people, if we're lucky, we can say that we can't not do what our profession is. But stories are the most ubiquitous form of entertainment and actually education for the longest time. And you can lose yourself in a story, experience something safely that you never would have. You can go through th these adventures. You can become a round, brown, a failed magician. So it builds empathy. But also imagination-wise, storytelling is so important in an age where everything is on a screen. We talk about the Incredibles and the screen slaver. When you tell a story, the listener is creating the images. What you see when I say that Blanca Flor was round and brown is different than what I see when I tell the story about her or when she's crossing the desert. Your desert is different than my desert. So it really stimulates the imagination. And it's also calming. As, as energetic as I am, there's a calming thing about telling stories. But do you think you're also drawn to storytelling because it does allow you to control the narrative? Yes. <laughs> I think it's very important that everybody control their narrative. Again, in these times, and if you if you look at the way that brown people are portrayed in the media, even if it's sometimes a, a kind of compassionate portrayal, it's a portrayal of the other. Kaylee, you've written, I believe we can harness the cultural wisdom in our stories 
and use the lessons we learn to grow ourselves and take care of each other. Is there a particular cultural wisdom that is important to you to share? There are so many coming from a community. And when I say community, I mean African-Americans in the U.S. and throughout the world. So as people from the African diaspora, making joy a priority in any circumstance, it is important no matter how much money you have, no matter your status, to infuse joy into as much as you can. And I see, I see people doing that all the time. And if you read stories from anywhere, but especially stories from Roma communities, Eastern Europe, indigenous African diaspora cultures, you see how joy and appreciation for whatever you have inside, as opposed to material wealth, how that will sustain you more than any of the consumerism that we participate in. I think the more modern we get, the more we're looking at images of people with things and have billions of dollars, the more we're looking at that and the less that we have, meaning if you have very little and you're looking at all this stuff on a screen, if you can know that your joy is worth at least as much as all of that other stuff, then you can continue to believe in the worth of your life, the purpose of your life. And you might even understand that all that stuff doesn't make people happy. It's just that they have the money to put it on a commercial and sell it to you. Kaylee, you also describe yourself as a story coach and cultural educator. What does that mean? I help people in groups and personally choose a personal parable as Blanca Flores to me to spread whatever message that they have, any burning message that they have for the world. For me as a coach, I'm interested in working with folk who have a social justice bent on giving messages. I coach teachers so that they can make education more interesting, which brings me to cultural education. When I first started as a storyteller, my mother said, no, you're not just a storyteller, you're a cultural educator, because I was a Spanish teacher coming out of college, Spanish high school, Spanish teacher. And I taught my kids dances and songs. So the cultural education is also that being a bridge of cultures of the African diaspora, including Latin America. Kaylee, I'd like to pick up on this idea of a personal parable, which is very different than a personal brand. What is the distinction that you see between a personal parable and a personal brand? Going back to that cultural wisdom of valuing joy whether or not you have material assets. The personal parable is something that you can carry with you that connects you to parables and to the history of oral tradition and a lot of times to your own cultural tradition in that a parable is really a metaphor in the shape of a story. It is valuable because it reflects your values. But because it's a story, because it's a parable, it almost, for me, Blanca Flor makes me feel less alone because in the parable is an archetype and I know other people embody that kind of archetype. Now, branding is, of course, a part of consumerist culture and marketing and entrepreneurism and all of that. And branding is creating an image of yourself 
for the purpose of selling something, selling your personality, selling your company, making yourself almost into a commodity and separating yourself from others. Look how special I am. Look how shiny my product is. I'm different. I'm better. Buy into this image of me. Whereas personal parable is, I would say, a quieter way of validating yourself. And you can share it with other people. And because it's a story and because of that experience of storytelling, which connects the listener to the teller, it's a way of connecting as opposed to differentiating uh, like a personal brand might. Kaylee, I'd like to talk about your life. You grew up in Charlotte in a prominent household. Who is your dad? My dad is James E. Ferguson II, and he is a longtime civil rights attorney who has been involved in many important local, state, and national cases. Internationally, he was a litigation trainer in South Africa before the fall of apartheid. And he trained black lawyers to learn the skill that he is best at, which is being in the courtroom. And he did that from the 80s to the 90s. And I feel like he went back in the 2000s and is still friends with some key folks who were in the government right after the fall of apartheid. And he did meet Nelson Mandela. He's noted for many cases, two of which are particularly prominent, including representing the Wilmington 10. Yes. And also helping desegregate the school system in Charlotte. Yes. The Wilmington 10 was the only group of Americans named Political prisoners, I think, was the name by Amnesty International. I know that was true for a very long time. That was one thing that I do remember learning from my actual parents growing up. And he was the junior attorney to uh, Julius Chambers on uh, Swan v. Board of Education, which, of course, was the famous integration and busing case, which made Charlotte the darling, the shining example of integration in the 70s, 80s, and into the 90s. What is it like growing up as the daughter of a prominent person? (laughs) We did not think about, when I say we, I say my brothers and I, I'm the youngest of three and I have two older brothers. So we didn't think about it in the house. But when I look back, we were a bit of an anomaly. There were a few other families, the Chambers, they were a lot older. The, chil- the Their children were older than, than I. So we had a unique experience. We knew people that later we found out were quote unquote a big deal. But we just knew them as, oh, that's Mel White or Harvey Gantt. We did. We grew up with them and their kids. So we got examples of what you can do and be that most folks don't. And luckily, my parents did not act like they were anything special. So it it was kind of a mixture of other people sometimes thinking we were really special and our parents being like, go outside and do the yard work. What did your dad teach you growing up? He taught me to be joyous. That man is so joyous. An example I have is that he really likes to party. We would have parties in our basement. I I can't remember a time when there weren't parties every month or two months, usually with a lot of the other black lawyers. There weren't a lot of black lawyers in the 80s here. My dad was the seventh 
black lawyer in Charlotte when he moved here in 67. So by the 80s, there were more, but not a lot. So we would all hang out. The kids would be able to be in the basement with the parents, music, blasting. He also taught me a love of music. He loves music. He taught me how to sing, he and my uncle. And he also taught me to work for causes that I believe in as best I as best I can. He he made a lot of financial sacrifices to do the work he did. What comes to mind when you think about your mom? My mom is a very shy woman who wants no credit, but she created my career and the career of a lot of children by starting the African American Children's Theater in 1981. And I was four when she started that, which is why I say I'm a community trained actor who's been acting since I was four years old. I'm 41 now. And she also is the one who has taught me how to manage money. She always, no matter how much money was coming in or not coming into her, she's had two nonprofits, into her nonprofits, especially the the children's theater, she always made sure that all the books were in order. She always made sure that every artist that she worked with got paid fairly. She was great with money, still is. She usually did not take money for herself as executive director of the children's theater. And I have learned how to be whatever kind of businesswoman I am from her. Kayla, you went to Piedmont Open Middle School and then into the International Baccalaureate Program at Myers Park High School. And the transition impacted you. Yes. How so? I left all of my friends except for four who went with me. And because I was so successful at throwing out assignments at Piedmont and because the atmosphere was so community oriented. When I went to IB at Myers Park, it was the first year they had it. And I was not ready for the amount of work. I was not used to being one of five black students in a group, a huge group of mainly white students. I think there was one Greek young lady. And the pressure was a trigger that caused me to have what we could call a nervous breakdown. And um, I remember telling my mom that I wanted to drop out of school and start my own school because I did not feel like the teachers were doing education the right way. And after that, I had two years of a really hard time in and out of mental hospitals. And I transferred to West Charlotte and finished high school there, despite spending a total of five months out of school because of my diagnosis of, at that time, it was manic depression. Kaylee, take me back to that time when you were diagnosed as manic depressive and what that meant to you as a teenager? It was so out of the blue. I was always a very, very happy, but also very emotionally expressive child. I would cry when I needed to cry. And I didn't know what was happening to my brain. My family definitely didn't know. And we had no experience with psychiatry, psychology, even being the prominent black family that we were. Because especially then, African-Americans didn't engage with psychologists. There weren't a lot of black psychologists. We just didn't know. So. The first time I had contact with a psychologist, I had already gone back to West Charlotte and this teacher booming voice was talking about the black death in Europe. And he put on the overhead projector, a picture of the black death. 
And I freaked out, ran out of the class in the middle of the session to my guidance counselor and just bursted out crying, told her I didn't want to live. And she called my dad. He came and got me. I can see the blue Lincoln. And she found a psychologist. We drove over there. By the time I got there, I had gathered myself together and the psychologist thought nothing was wrong with me. I think part of that is because there just wasn't space in our reality for for any of that. So it took a little while for things. It, things got worse to the point where my parents were like, OK, I guess we do need to take her to the hospital. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't read. I couldn't concentrate. I was bursting into tears all the time. I was paranoid that things that I was learning in school were really secret messages directed toward how bad of a person I was. And I remember, I think the night before I went to the hospital, I was just up in the house running around, couldn't calm down and my parents were like what is going on you know and they had already experienced other things but it would it would happen and then I would calm down it would happen I would calm down and it just one night it was I just was acting so erratic that they just had to break down and do the thing that they really did not want to do which is take me to the hospital when I got to the hospital, they they put me in a straight jacket in a room filled with tiles on the wall and a bed in the middle of the room. And it took me years to get over the fact that the hospital had done that to me. I don't I just honestly I don't think that's the best protocol for especially a teenager who's never had an experience with mental illness. So after that first night, they finally got me to take meds because I was, it, it's hard to explain, but I was not calm and compliant, shall we say. So once they got me to take some very sedating medications, I they put me in a room. And for the next month, I actually was not talking, walking, or eating. I was a level of catatonic. And later I found out that my parents thought they were just going to have to send me to this place in Asheville. And they, you know, it was like biggest devastation of their life. And they had me in this crazy old wooden wheelchair and they would wheel me around and try to get me to eat. And I wouldn't and I was conscious of everything that was going on but I don't know and then they said we're going to feed you intravenously if you don't and I started eating and eventually started talking we think that it was one of the medications after that it was group therapy art therapy with somebody who would come once a week twice a week a dog did pet therapy and I was in the hospital that year, my 10th grade year for two and a half months. And near the end, I had to catch up with my schoolwork in hospital school. And then I had to prepare to go back to school and practice answers to people while I was gone so long. I'll tell you one quick thing. I had forgotten the first day I went back to West Charlotte, I had forgotten to take my hospital band off because you have that every day you shower with it. And I was in Mr. Cox's math class. And I won't say her name, but a classmate was like, why do you have that on and where have you been? I don't even remember what I said, but that that's just to illustrate a struggle that people may not know about when you're a teenager going through that. The first year, my parents did not want me to be on anything. And then the next year, everything happened worse. So in 11th grade, I was prescribed lithium and Prozac. How has that shaped you since? It has 
limited the things that I've either thought I could do or that I actually could do in my older years. When I was young, I was just still trying to be a teenager, still trying to hang out. So the difference was basically they had scared me out of drinking and drugs. So even my friends, my friends were like, God, girl, but I, I never drank. I never did drugs. And, but when I was a teenager and in college, it wasn't a big deal to me because I was young. And when you're young, you're just, you're just trying to live. And for me, graduate both high school and college. College actually was pretty uneventful when it came to that. I had a lot of fun. When I got out of college, I got a teaching job in the Bronx. I was living in Brooklyn. There was an hour commute and I was 22 and living in New York and wanted to party. So a lot of times I would go to sleep late, have to jump up, go to work and wouldn't take my medication because you have to eat a lot to take lithium. Lithium is very potent. And eventually it wore me down to the, to the point where I ended up having to go in an ambulance in handcuffs to a hospital, kind of an infamous hospital, Kings County in, in Brooklyn, New York, when I was 22. So that's when things started to dawn on me. It's, it started to dawn on me that things were going to be harder for me in, in, in a lot of ways. Fast forward to now, and I've been off lithium for a long time and had to find something to replace it. And um, now I look back and I realize how even though I've been lucky as a person diagnosed with mental illness, and I have a new diagnosis, which is schizoaffective, which is a shorthand. It's a combination of paranoia, which is associated sometimes with schizophrenia, and what they call an affective or a mood disorder. And it turns out I never had that classic up and down mania What I had was depression with the inability to calm down or read or concentrate. So schizoaffective tells a different story. It says that I have paranoia, anxiety, that kind of thing mixed with a depression that goes beyond even clinical depression because it it has it's a mixture of both depression and inability to, to concentrate, rest, sleep. Yeah. These are hard things to explain for, for each person that has it. Kaylee, how do you understand the distinction between mental illness and mental health? I actually don't know that there's a distinction. I think that mental health is a spectrum. So if we're looking at illness, any kind of illness, your health is, at one place or another. So the term mental illness is tricky because in a lot of ways I'm labeled mentally ill, but my emotional health may be ideal for people who have never been diagnosed. And so emotional health and mental health go one and the same for me. So moving to mental health, mental health is the composite of how you deal with the world, whether that be because of your genetics, your brain chemistry, your past traumatic experiences, or if you've had none of those and you still have a hard time dealing with the world, if you freak out if you get really stressed about every little thing, your mental health may be wanting for the things that somebody who like me is labeled mentally ill has. So honestly, because of the therapy that I've gotten and because of the ways that I've had to regulate myself, my mental health in some areas may be an example to folks who have never had to deal with being 
somewhere and having an internal panic attack and still having to stay there until they could get out. Where do you think of yourself on that spectrum? I don't think of myself as mentally ill anymore. At the same time, I don't like to reject the term mental illness. I would say that the way that my brain and emotions work do not fit into the everyday norm. The reason why I say that is because, unfortunately, the traditional mental health model doesn't have room for things like being super intuitive or having a lot of empathy, which I do call myself an empath. And those things affect my mental health. Because if I'm around you and I'm feeling that you've just come from a really hard fight, but I don't know that it's that that I'm picking up on. Well, for the rest of the day, I'm reacting to all of that for quote unquote, no reason. But when I'm actually just picking up on emotions or energy that other folks may not always even feel as strongly themselves, and I might be acting out in a certain way, the medical model would not understand that. And it took me a long time to understand that was going on. So I I would say that I function mentally and emotionally differently than the norm at this point in societal history. Kaylee, what delights you? Art and culture, music, stories, Great conversations. I'm not a good small talker, but I love to hear people's stories. I love to read and I love to dance and I I, I write songs. And so that's what delights me. And food. <laughs> what are you curious about? I am curious about how we got where we are in so many ways. I'm curious about modern mythology. I'm curious about the dynamics that make it okay for a lot of us for the world to be stratified in the way that it is. Make it okay for us to walk around. I mean, I live in a gorgeous house. Why is it okay that I do? And there's so many people who dream of living in any house. Kaylee, what gives you hope? People... And for me, I'm going to just get esoteric again. The the inexplicable miracles, for lack of a better word, that have surprised me and saved me in times when I honestly, Mark, especially with the mental illness diagnosis, and I think everybody experiences this at some point, if we're lucky, the miracles that let you go on when you really thought there were no options. That is amazing to me. And it humbles me and people's resilience humble me and children. They're just amazing. And finally, Kaylee, what are you certain about? Ooh, I am certain that I've had a good life and I am certain that I want for everyone to have a good life. And I am certain that art and culture heal and can move us towards that. Thank you for your time today, Kaylee. Thank you so much, Mark. Kaylee Ferguson is a storyteller and cultural educator. She earned a BA in Spanish education from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. And now, a personal word. Kaylee Ferguson is an empath. Spend any time with her and you feel yourself being absorbed. She is sensitive to moods, she listens carefully, and she expresses the joys and bruises of the world with deep insight and grace. Here are some traits of empaths noted by Dr. Judith Orloff in Psychology Today. 
Empaths filter the world through their intuition. They are highly sensitive. They are wide open and nurturing, attuned to other people's feelings, often to the extreme. They take on positivity around them, feeling a rush of peace and love, but also negativity, which can be exhausting for them. As super responders, empaths need time alone to recharge. Empaths can be overwhelmed in intimate relationships. They can be engulfed and lose their identity. The hustle and bustle of everyday life can be too much. Quiet in nature restore them. Empaths are compassionate, drawn to ease the pain of sentient life around them. To carry on, empaths must set boundaries, fiercely manage their time, and attend to self-care. Combine these empathetic qualities with Kaylee's talents and interests, her performance skills, her knowledge of folk tales, her poetry and songwriting, her fluency in English and Spanish, her passion for the oral traditions of Latin America and the African diaspora, her own intersectional identity as a black woman in America, and her family legacy of civil rights and social justice and you have the makings of a unique and powerful body of work. Here are just a few of Kaylee's accomplishments. Exploring the connection between Spanish Catholic hymns and the poetry of the Harlem Renaissance. Organizing coalitions to unite black and brown people in North Carolina. Leading creativity workshops in elementary schools. Publishing essays on the importance of crossing borders and learning to tell our own stories. Inviting folks to a festival to sample the food and music of the African diaspora. Mississippi cornbread, Liberian potato greens, and songs by Sade. Drawing attention to the plight of the homeless. Coaching early education teachers on integrating the performing arts into their curriculum. And designing a storytelling web-based course for immigrant and marginalized populations. Kaylee has done all this work by choice, but also because the route of traditional employment has been closed off to her. What Kaylee did not share in this interview was the cost of her psychiatric illness on her career. In an email exchange, I asked her if there was a connection between her diagnosis as manic depressive and later as schizoaffective and being a storyteller. Kaylee wrote back, So, if I had not had the trouble I've had keeping jobs as a teacher, I never would have had the time and mental air between careers as a black-brown community bridging organizer in Durham and a master's student at Florida International University in Africana Studies to understand and pursue telling the stories I was reading anyway. I had to go through a lot of therapy to become okay with not being able to have regular jobs like other people because the stress nearly broke me. I asked her in that same email exchange if she sees her life as a fractured fairy tale. Kaylee responded, Hmm, I would not call it that. I do have a unique situation and some huge blessings I can take no credit for. But at the end of the day, I am very, very human. I want decently normal things like good movies on Netflix and people I can trust who understand my mind and my joys and challenges. I want us all to have something like storytelling or music in our lives, though it requires the best kind of work to maintain a quality relationship with anything or anyone worth keeping. Storytelling, music, loving relationships are all worth keeping, so I work at them. If there is magic, it is in the appreciation and humility required to share that. My job is to promote a change in our modern mythology that uplifts this kind of appreciation and approach. Kaylee Ferguson reminds us of our gifts of imperfection. We are all less than we might hope for and greater than what we might imagine. This is Mark Paris, and you've been listening to on life and meaning. Additional support for this podcast is provided by the UNC College of Arts and Architecture, celebrating a decade 
of creative education in the arts and design. Thank you to our funding partners and to my teammates, Andy Goh, producer of the show, and to Chris Curriton, art and media director. This is how you can help. Please write a review on iTunes. It helps us grow our audience. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And become a patron. We are on Patreon, a crowdsourcing platform that allows you to support what you value at a level you choose. Visit us also on our website on lifeandmeaning.com. Thank you for listening.